Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. In 19th century New York City, sex was for sale, and it wasn't hard to find it. Commodified sex was everywhere and available for any price. Stick around as we talk about prostitution, brothels, and the madams who ran them. I'm Elizabeth garner Mazarik, And I'm Sarah Hanley-Cousins. And we're your historians for this episode of DIG. <laughs> We want to start off by talking about nomenclature here. Oh, such a great word, nomenclature. We're going to be using the terms prostitute and prostitution, as opposed to the more modern term of sex worker. This is a choice on our part because we want to use the terms that were used and understood at the time that we're talking about, even though maybe that's not language that we we would use today. Also, a note on the use of the label prostitute. Uh, Women who even acted a certain way could be considered a prostitute if they were loud, drunk, vagrant, if they were treated, in other words, traded, if they traded dates and sex for dinners or lodging or entertainment, they could also be labeled as a prostitute. Uh, It's also important to point out that the legal definition of prostitute was not set in stone during the period that we'll be discussing. The illegality of the physical act of trading sex for money was not codified into a universal law, and many states did not pass laws banning the physical act of prostitution until the 1920s. Many prostitutes instead ran into trouble with the law um, that maybe prohibit, prohibited public drunkenness, lewdness, vagrancy, or, or even cursing or swearing, okay? Um, so that might not be illegal or even defined by the law, um, but instead a woman could be hauled into court for, say, vagrancy or drunkenness and be labeled a prostitute. Mm-hmm. Essentially, it was a form of social control over the acts of women, whether they exchanged sex for cash or not. Right. Um, also... Listeners, we're going to be describing a few sexual acts and other things that some may not find appropriate, so please listen with discretion. During the 18th century, prostitution in New York City was mainly concentrated in the southernmost tip of Manhattan Island. Sorry, that sounds dirty to me. Tip. Close to the docks and wharves, primarily concentrated on certain streets. One Frenchman in 1794 noted... Whole sections of streets are given over to the streetwalkers for the plying of their profession. Women of every color can be found in the streets, particularly after 10 o'clock at night, soliciting men and proudly flaunting their licentiousness in the most shameless manner. By the 1820s, prostitution and the proliferation of brothels had moved further north up main thoroughfares like Broadway, Church Street and the Bowery and into neighborhoods like Five Points. Five Points was considered by many well-to-do 19th century commentators as one of the most miserable slums in the Western Hemisphere. It became known as an area of public drunkenness, prostitution, crime, and gambling. Interestingly, it was also the most interracial neighborhood in all of New York City. Mm -hmm. And this was before the crackdown of stricter racial segregation that began in the 1830s and increased throughout the century all over the country. But in the early 19th century, black and whites frequently mingled in living quarters, saloons, brothels, and other public areas in Five Points. Isn't Five Points the neighborhood that uh, the movie Gangs of New York takes place in? Tis, tis the one. Oh, so so if you've seen that movie, you can kind of picture what we're talking about. Absolutely. And I I mention it a little bit later, too, in the the text. Yeah. Um, Yeah. One one moralizing contemporary noted that Five Points was, quote, the spot where black and white promiscuously mingle and nightly celebrate disgusting orgies. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, this is somebody that's obviously up on their haunches, right? right? And, oh, I, um, the ways that 19th century Americans used the terms promiscuous and orgy didn't always necessarily mean sex, 
right? Like a group could be mingling promiscuously just based on the fact that black and white people were in close proximity to another. That was a promiscuous gathering. Right. It didn't necessarily mean that they were boning on the street. And also a promiscuous gathering could be mixed of male and female. Exactly. Right. 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 Prostitution in Five Points was often cited for its very public nature. A former brewery turned boarding house uh, next to the infamous Murderer's Row alleyway rented rooms to prostitutes. And while on the ground floor and the basement, uh, these were filled with different saloons. One account wrote, women bareheaded, bare-armed, and bare-bosomed stared in the doorway or on the sidewalk, inviting passers-by indiscriminately to enter or exchanging oaths and obscenities with the inmates of the next house, similarly employed. One reason sex was of such a public nature in the Five Points was because people lived in extremely close quarters. Many apartments housed numerous family members and boarders, Privacy was just not something that many people living in Five Points could enjoy. Right. Another area that became home to numerous brothels, saloons, and streetwalkers was the neighborhood known as the Bowery. The Bowery itself was a large boulevard that cut through the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Early in the 19th century, it was home to a working class culture of native-born whites and Irish and German immigrants that lived, worked, and played there. Later in the century, they were replaced by Italians, Jews, and other newer immigrant groups who carried on as well as created new forms of commercialized vice in the area. So the years between roughly 1850 to about 1910 were the years that commercialized sex and vice in New York City were the most visible and the most prolific and the most wild. In 1857, Walt Whitman wrote that any man passing along Broadway between Houston, excuse me, that's my Texan going out. <laughs> I was going to say <laughs> between Houston and Fulton streets finds the Western sidewalk full of prostitutes jaunting up and down there by ones, twos or threes on the lookout for customers. At that time, Broadway was the center of city life. By day, the streets bustled with shoppers going to shops and dry goods stores. At night, theaters, shows, and every kind of amusement were on hand. The increased visibility of sex in the city was part of a larger commodification of leisure activities in the 19th century. Concert saloons, gambling establishments, and brothels all operated as places where more than one, quote, vice could be acquired. Hmm. All of this vice activity emerged with the rise of the phenomenon called the sporting culture. The sporting men, or the rise of sporting culture, began during the antebellum period and lasted into the Gilded Age. It organized around numerous forms of gaming, such as horse racing, pugilism, or what we might call today boxing, although I think we should still call it pugilism, uh, rat baiting, which sounds horrible, cockfighting, and gambling. So basically blood sports. This subculture also promoted male aggressiveness and sexual promiscuity. Hmm, wonder why. <laughs> Monogamous heterosexual intercourse, or uh, what? How, how can we translate that? Uh, sex between monogamous male-female partners yeah. was associated with femininity and the domestic sphere, whereas prostitution and erotic entertainments coupled with blood sports and communal drinking were associated with male youth culture. From the 1830s and continuing throughout the 19th century, men, both married and unmarried, increasingly engaged with commodified sex outside of marriage. Many people, well, men, (laughs) argued that brothels and prostitution was actually a good in society because it allowed men to use up their sexual energy with willing women. Otherwise, they argued rape would be rampant. Um, and forgive me if you talk about this. I mean, this is also the age uh, where women are believed to be inherently cold. Mm-hmm. Um, at the very least, frigid. good women, right? right? Like a good, a good, a good Victorian woman, woman was, was frigid, frigid right? right? And so it was considered a good thing to have, uh, not maybe not a good thing, um, a necessary evil for men to have to go to prostitutes and sow their wild oats because they shouldn't do that with their wives. That was actually defiling their wives. Right. 
Uh, one sporting newspaper wrote, the cause of morality is not served by the suppression of open brothels. They are as essential to the well-being of society as churches. That's an interesting way of looking at it. Walt Whitman commented, the custom is to go among prostitutes as an ordinary thing. Nothing is thought of it. Or rather, the wonder is, how would there be any fun without it? There were social stratifications among sporting men. The Bowery Boy was a younger working class youth who played in the area of the Bowery and prized male brawn and camaraderie over all else. Alternatively, fancy men, like the Broadway dandy, reveled mostly in leisure and sexual pleasure as opposed to blood sport. Many sporting men invariably traveled in and out of different class and social spaces, and they interacted with uh, one another in various ways. Um, What sporting culture did was allowed young middle-class men working as clerks and accountants to rub elbows with working-class men from the Bowery. A uh, male-centered egalitarianism kind of bridged the gap between the Bowery boy and the upper tendum boys and dandies, and upper tendum boy being um, one of these youths from the Tenderloin District, which was a little more upscale Mm. and moneyed. One 19th century reformer wrote about the fashionable leisure culture that encompassed sporting men by saying, Dressed in the height of fashion, see them walk into the gilded saloons, their little canes under their arms, with skin-tight gloves, taking off one glove, saying with the air of a prince, What will you have, boys? (laughs) There's also a cool rundown of some of these fellas in the movie Gangs of New York. Right, yeah. Um, When it's, It's kind of early in the movie when Leonardo DiCaprio's character is kind of being introduced to all of the the people in and around Five Points. And mm-hmm. so they, they show kind of what some of these Bowery boys would, would look like in the dandies. Mm-hmm. They're, they're, they're funny little outfits. I love I love that movie. It's I just too. It does such a good job of showing this culture. It does. It is a good movie. And I just noticed it's on Hulu right now. Oh, yeah, I didn't know I that. Might have to, I, I haven't seen it in a long yeah. time. New York theaters acted as an invaluable link between prostitution and sporting culture. The dark, semi-secluded third-tier balconies, dubbed the guilty third tier, were reserved for prostitutes and their clients. Sponsored by John Jacob Astor, uh, was known for prostitution in its third tier. Then there were the sub-theaters, which did not restrict prostitution or public sexuality to the third tier, and was, quote, little better than a brothel turned inside out, according to one commentator in 1849. The streets that surrounded theaters always housed plenty of brothels and body houses. Brothels were the pinnacle of sex for sale in 19th century New York City. A brothel could range from a simple boarding house to lush parlor houses with the latest interior fashions and design. One of the most notorious madams in New York City was a woman named Kate Woods. She ran a number of brothels throughout the city for over half a century and was a celebrity in her own right. In the 1870s, Wood operated the Hotel du Wood. <laughs> yeah, I know. There's, I, I have to think there's a double entendre there. Right, right, right. <laughs> Wood is her last name, but come on. <laughs> uh, according to a guidebook designed to lead gentlemen through New York's sexual underground, um, the book itself was called A Vest Pocket Guide to Brothels in 19th Century New York for Gentlemen on the Go. Why is there a... Like, that's wild. That I like, know. And let that, me get my guidebook so I know... Well, think about Where it. I mean, if you, if you, boned. yes, I mean, think, mm-hmm. of, I mean, if people use guidebooks for everything, for the, the best restaurants, like, right, and it's I'm a sure, Zagat guide to I, exactly, sex. Exactly, to sex. That's and this amazing. was like one of many, like the, there were. That's wild. And it's funny because some of them were printed, um, and even this one is printed of, as a, as a way to avoid places to oh, go. Oh, right, right. So okay. here's some places you shouldn't wind up because they're very horrible. And that let is, me tell you how horrible they are. That is amazing. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so the best pocket guide to brothels. Um, the Hotel uh, Hotel du Wood was listed at uh, 105 West 25th Street, and that was among other more upscale brothels. Mm. The Hotel du Wood was described as a three-story brown home, or brownstone that we would call it today, and it was furnished throughout with the most costly and newest decor and amenities. The guidebook states that her gallery, so Kate Wood's gallery of oil paintings alone, cost $10,000. 
The brothel was listed as having rosewood furniture, immense mirrors, Parisian figures, and the guidebook went on to say that she, being Kate Woods, keeps three young ladies of rare personal attractions, and that the house was the best overall on 25th Street. It even mentioned that the Hotel du Wood catered to many foreign gentlemen and dignitaries, and I'm assuming that that made it seem like a classier joint? I, I don't know. Yeah, it, it almost makes it sound like there are legitimate reasons why you would go visit this brownstone. Like, go and look at her art, right? Oh, go and right. look at the beautiful um, architecture or whatever, the way that she's designed the inside. Oh. For whatever reason, Kate Woods closed the Hotel de Wood, but she immediately opened the House of All Nations in the 1880s. This brothel was located in the fashionable Tenderloin District, so that may be an, have been one reason why she moved. She's just kind of moving further north as mm -hmm. as the city changed. Um, you know, class and money kind of went further north. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the... And the new brothel that she opened is described as being just as opulent as the Hotel de Wood. The House of All Nations was renowned for having famous prostitutes from all over the world. They were actually often referred to as stars. And for a pretty penny, one could be entertained by women from Ireland, France, Germany, England, Asia, Africa, and South America. Each room was decorated with furnishings from whatever country the woman who lived in it was from. And after visiting, some young men bragged that they may not have traveled much, but they managed to see a lot of the world in one night. Which is a brag, because Gross. how many guys do you know can go multiple times a night? Right, right, so right. Yeah, they're, they're making They really up. were bragging. Yeah, like they went to France and then they fell asleep. And then they... <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, boy. Many women who worked at the House of All Nations specialized in the French style, which consisted of unnatural acts, which a uh, code word for oral sex, which wh why are these things always the French style, oh. right? The French are the only one that give blowjobs, apparently. Yeah. Um, reformers often blamed Paris for these unnatural acts, prompting one social reformer to complain that women working in, quote unquote, French houses quote, stoop to practices that an ordinary American girl could not be induced to do. Right. <laughs> it's interesting to note, though, that a study in 1908 found that of 2,000 surveyed prostitutes, almost three quarters were American born. So uh, the American women were just as kinky as Parisian women. Yeah. yeah. So it was just an excuse. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. New York City provided men with just about any kink or pleasure one could think of. With such a wide variety of public brothels and parlor houses, some houses catered to individual clientele and tastes. For example, Clara Gordon's brothel on Mercer Street only catered to Southern gentlemen. Sarah Sweet's Church Street house offered only Creole women to interested men. Over on Mott Street, one could find ropes and braces at Rebecca Wayman's place, while Louisa Kant's house catered exclusively to German merchants. What, what, ropes and braces? Ropes and braces. What does that mean? I would assume is it like BD a BDSM. SM kind oh, of that's thing? super interesting. S super duper. Yeah. French love was available at Miss French's on West 27th Street and... You've already mentioned what French love could be, so I think we can figure out what was going on there. Oh, right, right, right. We know what was going on in this French. <laughs> As the 19th century wore on, sexual intercourse became just one of many ways that sex became commodified. Numerous sexual activities were available for a mass audience, and that included pornography, model artist striptease shows, masked balls where prostitutes freely rubbed elbows with the elite of society, the concert saloon, private drinking rooms and supper rooms and otherwise respectable restaurants, which catered to prostitutes and their patrons and shows within brothels and parlor houses. This sexual entertainment coexisted along streets filled with theaters, the new large department stores, fancy restaurants, and numerous saloons. No longer was sex and prostitution only associated with poverty or the working class culture, like that which was found in neighborhoods like the Five Points earlier in the century. This new sexual culture served an increasingly important leisure economy to the late 19th century cosmopolitan city. 
Some dance halls and brothels staged live sex shows for their patrons. For $5, a patron could enter a popular brothel on Green Street, sit down at a small table, and watch as three women performed a striptease to the music of the house's piano player. The striptease would eventually turn into an orgy where the women would perform or pretend to perform oral sex upon one another. This was a popular type of show called the Busy Fleas Dance. (laughs) Sorry. The busy fleas. That just, that doesn't go together. Like you're like, these women would take off their clothes and then <laughs> perform oral sex on each other. And we called it the busy fleas. Well, okay. And here's, here's the big thing too. They would wear these dresses called Mother Hubbard dresses. And so think back of like old timey pictures where you, where you see these women wearing, it's basically like a night shirt. That goes okay. to their ankle, right? Mm-hmm. It's very loose. It kind of usually buttons up the yeah, front. Yeah, That was the pinnacle of, like, lingerie at the time. Because they're not all, like, pinned in and corseted and this, that, and the other. So, oh. like, it would be it would be sensual or sexy to see a woman in the Mother Hubbard dress. Cause yeah, because it's all loose underneath. Flopping around and, you know. <laughs> Isn't that fascinating that today we've kind of flip-flopped that, right? Like, mm-hmm. lingerie now is much more constraining right it's mm-hmm. like corsets and mm-hmm. what are those things garters and all that stuff Sky instead and, of like yeah. they came out wearing loose old lady nightgowns they came out wearing <laughs> moo-moos and right. it made the guys go wild yes <laughs> yes Love it. um another brothel had a similar flea dance although it was much more raunchy where women would put their heads quote between the legs of one another and their mouths upon the sexual organs or vagina oh my. and drink beer that was poured upon the vagina of one girl by the other oh my goodness placing a cigar in the rectum of one of the girls who had thrown her limbs and feet above her head others feigned intercourse with each other and sucked each other's breasts oh my End goodness quote. gracious <laughs> i love that that's a quote You're right <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is amazing. Hey, we just want to pause here for a second for a word from our sponsor. We are very lucky to be sponsored by Revolver Records, which is actually the only remaining record store in Buffalo, New York. Revolver Records specializes in quality vinyl and new vinyl releases. Phil from Revolver Records is always buying record collections, both big and small, and paying top dollar. And you don't need to be in Buffalo to check it out. Just go to RevolverRecordsInc.com. A club on Bleecker Street offered a variety show that showcased the Jarbean Fairy. I just can't with these names. What is a Jarbean? I don't know. That. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) Google Jarbean. Jarbean fairy. Mm. Like, is it Jarbean? Like, is that a, I don't know, is it some kind of, like, African thing? Jarbean? Oh, it's yeah. Word? Yeah. Uh, wait, which was a gay, effeminate man, a woman sodomite for hire. Yeah, so these, this is these like are a variety different. show. Oh, okay, yeah, right. so you Those had are two the different fairy, things. which was a gay. He was the J- Jarbean fairy. Yeah. Okay. And then the woman sodomite for hire would have anal sex with a man on stage or with for an some animal. Reason, I was from Chauncey. That's you got that? I was thinking she was having anal sex with the man. So I was like, oh, oh my God, they use strap-ons. No, but no. They, you know, and I, I think they probably did. There was, I didn't write them down, but there were some other things where women would, like, would penetrate, penetrate another woman with a dildo. Oh. I haven't seen women penetrating men. I think that might have been too much. But maybe not. Doesn't say on the internet what are being Okay. All right. I would think like a vagina is a jar. You just made that up. Maybe your maybe the jar maybe your jar bean is your clitoris. It is definitely <laughs> that's what it is. From now on. Your next time. <laughs> next, time. I just got it. <laughs> that's awful. next time you're having sex, I want you to say, you yo. Know, the jar touch bean. my jar bean. <laughs> oh, oh, that jar bean. <laughs> Holy cow. All right. This episode is is really great. These outtakes are going to be spot The Jarbean Fairy. Okay. Okay. All right. right. A club on Bleecker Street offered a variety show that showcased the, quote, Jarbean Fairy, which was a uh, effeminate gay man, 
a woman sodomite for hire that would have anal sex with a man on stage or animal and what they would have termed a hermaphrodite that would exhibit their genitalia as part of a live show. Model artist shows became popular around the mid-century. These were also called living statues or living female paintings. Is this, uh, this is also what they used to call a tableau vivant, right? The peop- mid-century, uh, 19, mid-19th century folks were like obsessed with tableau vivants, which were like this. They would just like pose mm, mm-hmm. in, uh, mm-hmm. you know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. I do know what you're talking about. Okay. About. These were also called living statues or living female paintings. A female performer would freeze in a pose, usually scantily clad or wearing nothing at all, as if in a painting. These shows often mimicked classical paintings like Venus Rising from the Sea or The Greek Slave. The performer would change positions periodically, or some venues even had revolving stages so that audiences could view all of the areas of her body. But what about direct people to the Hulu show Harlots? Because they show this, this very thing in the episodes, in the high class. Oh, Just say okay. it loud. Come over here. Just say, oh, I gotta go in. I gotta say something. If you all want to see this for yourselves, yeah, yeah, with boobies, um, Hulu. Always want to see boobies. Always want to see boobies. Hulu's new show, newest show about 18th century harlots in London. They have the high class brothel. It has hmm. women doing these, but it's from the 18th tableaus. century. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. I know tableau vivants were really popular for a long time. Yeah. Uh, or these like living pictures. Yeah. Have you ever seen the movie? Um, I'm just thinking of Arrested Development personally. Why, what do they do in Arrested they Development? They do that like they have a yearly like like do like, they re- show? I don't and remember. And so they're doing what's what's God and yeah. what's what is Michelangelo that? Yeah. and the and Sistine so Chapel. There's, he's got like the teeny weeny little penis, right? And so Michael Sarah has to. Like, <laughs> I don't remember he this. Gets the, he gets the penis in the box and it's like three inches long and he doesn't want to do it. I I gotta rewatch Arrested Development. Yeah, it's been do. so long. There, what's the movie about the lady who can't sing but she thinks she can sing? Mm. You know what I'm talking about? I didn't know you're talking uh, about. Fl- Fl- Florence Foster Jenkins. Yes. They do a tableau vivant. This is like the first scene of the movie is oh. a tableau vivant mm-hmm. on stage. Jenkins. Florence Foster Jenkins. It's really adorable. But it's about this really rich lady who thinks that she's an opera singer, but oh, really Lord. she's horrible. Your is it a new movie. or old movie? It came out last year. Really? God, I missed that. It's really funny. And it's really sad also because she dies. Okay, sorry. Uh, you just well, totally it, like ruined that for all died? the people. I mean, she, yeah, she wasn't like 12. I mean, she was. She was like 70 or something. It's really good. Go home and watch it. Hmm. Harlots first. Yeah, and Harlots is on the list. And then first. perform a tableau vivant. <laughs> Show if Marissa, <laughs> if Marissa was here, she'd be really, <laughs> she'd be mad at the way that I'm pronouncing tableau vivant. Yeah, but well, well, we're yeah. Americanist, she goddamn she it. She'd say it with some fancy <laughs> French accent. She would. All right, here we go. So let's Jarbean, talk about Jarbean, let's, Jarbean. let's talk about the concert saloon now. Oh, my one of my favorite movies, Far and Away. Have you all <gasps> seen that? Oh one? my god, okay. yes. Because nobody's ever seen no, it. No, I. Like, okay, I love that movie, and I always Ooh. think of the concert saloon in that movie, mm-hmm. and they have the. Okay, I say it pugilism. How do you say it? Pugilism. Pugil- pugilism. All right. Well, they're boxing, right? And it's she's actually it's pugilism. And, uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> that's the way I want to say it. <laughs> so, <laughs> pugs fighting on stage. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. Oh, but Far and Away, that movie makes oh me ball I every time. I love that, that movie. such a good movie. And I hate those two actors now with a passion. I do, too. But I don't. But I was, like, obsessed with them when too. I was, like, in seventh grade. I was, too. Yeah. I was, too. All right. Anyway. So, so, so for another good example uh, in a movie of a concert saloon, watch Far and Away, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, entertainment venues called concert saloons, as I've just been rambling all about, um, they grew in popularity starting in about the 1870s. And these would usually be in kind of older theaters, right? So it'd be a, a theater that's kind of run down or whatever, mm-hmm. and it would be turned into one of these concert saloons. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. Um, and what these did is they joined live entertainment, like boxing or pugilism, um, with drinking and women, right? Um, so female and male performers and waitresses could and often doubled as prostitutes and solicited customers as they worked the crowd. Mm-hmm. 
can I pause you for a second? Another movie, yeah, is Le Moulin is Moulin Rouge. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Even yeah. though it's in France, but it's yeah. like another good yeah. depiction of this. Yeah. Um, some concert saloons had darkened balconies and private rooms for private shows and ultimately sex. Harry Hills was one of the most popular and well-known concert saloons in 19th century New York City. Hills attracted all walks of life, from working class Bowery boys to congressmen and judges. Mm. Hills was one of the first public establishments with electric lighting, and his landlord was none other than P.T. Barnum. That is wild. Yeah. <laughs> um, Hills was a little bit different from many concert saloons because he demanded an air of respectability. He demanded that patrons avoid bad behavior. Uh, he had a dress code, and he um, demanded that prostitutes and women of, quote, doubtful character refrain from boisterous, loud behavior, essentially. Um, sporting men were expected to treat the women as ladies, even if they were prostitutes. Another popular concert saloon in the Tenderloin was called the Haymarket, and it was known as the Moulin Rouge of New York. Uh, People described it as shining with the brilliancy of a Broadway theater at night, so, Mm. you know, lit up to the nines kind of thing. Yeah. Not trying to hide. No, and it's funny because uh, they actually talked about, like, during the day, kind of like bars now. Like, yeah. during the day, they just look so ugh and dingy. Right. But at night, they're just lit up. Right, right, right. Bright, and mm-hmm. it was the same kind of thing. Yeah. Armory Hall Concert Saloon was located near the tenements and cheaper saloons of the Lower East Side of the Bowery and was well known for allowing and encouraging homosexual activity between its patrons. The hall was dimly lit with a balcony on both sides, Partitioned into compartments available for prostitutes and waiter girls to take their clients. Also, many younger gay men worked at the Armory Hall and were, quote, painted or powdered and rouged and sometimes wearing women's clothing. They wandered through the crowd and sang and danced and solicited customers. According to the historian George Chauncey, who you should all go home and read right now Mm because he's great. (laughs) This was a time where homosexuality and heterosexuality were just not as rigidly defined as they become later in the 20th century. In fact, the term homosexual didn't even really enter English usage until the 1880s. There are numerous examples of male prostitutes working alongside women in New York City brothels and concert saloons. Most critiques of such activity did not focus on the homosexual act per se, but on the effeminate behavior of certain males. So it wasn't the sex that was a problem. It was the effeminacy. Mm-hmm. Effeminacy. Effeminacy? Sounds good. I made up that word. Yeah. Critics argued those men were upending the gender order, not by their sexual acts, but by their effeminate demeanor. By accepting homosexual advances, those men were displaying notions of weakness or passivity, both prescribed gender roles for women. Chauncey noted, quote, gay male society was a highly visible part of the urban sexual underworld and was much more fully and publicly integrated into working class rather than middle class culture. The Bowery functioned as the center of the working class entertainment district and had the highest concentration of male prostitutes during this time period. However, it's important to point out that many middle class men and women visited the Bowery entertainment district as well. And there was this thing called slumming that Mm -hmm. kind of upper middle class people would do and they would actually kind of get all their friends and they would go quote unquote slumming and they'd go down to the Bowery. Right. So a lot of what we know, or not a lot of, but some of what we know about places like Armory where, um, you know, homosexual men worked as prostitutes are from these kind of accounts of of middle class people slumming. Yeah. So they are just going to kind of gawk. Right, right, right. So they're tinged with a little bit of... um, I don't know, condescension. Absolutely. But uh, not to say that uh, middle class men would never go and partake Mm -hmm. either, right? Um, Both young women and young men participated in the city's nightlife. Um, And I'm just going to read you a description from a middle class reformer. So again, a bit condescending, but it still gives us a good idea of what the Bowery looked like in about 1896. Quote, it is a center for saloons of every order, from gin palaces to bucket shops, theaters, concert halls, 
free and easies, and dye museums abound, all of them profusely ornamented with every device of colored light. In and out of these resorts pours a constant crowd. Shouts of laughter come from within, mingled with the sound of orchestra or the jingle of cheap pianos. The German music halls have respectable audiences. The rest are filled with young men and boys and girls barely out of their teens. The shooting galleries are no less crowded, brilliantly lighted and often open to the sidewalk, gaudily painted figures serving as targets and every inducement being offered the passerby to try his skill. And here's a description of Bleecker Street from the late 1880s. Quote, Both sides were filled with dance halls, saloons, and sporting houses. You could meet from 50 to 100 girls any night going the few short blocks from Broadway to the Bowery and many more men. But Allen? Oh, man, I love that. But Allen's famous dance and concert hall with gambling den attached was there. Harry Hill's noted dive was one block below on Houston Street. In Mulberry Street, a short distance away, were the subcellar dives, two stories below ground under the control of Italians, where for a few cents degraded men and women could go in out of the cold and remain overnight, sleeping on the damp, dirty floors or else sitting on the broken, rickety chairs. <laughs> damp dirty floors and broken so ag- rickety again, chairs yeah, yeah important really to remember that these are reformers judgmental yeah right 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 um uh, men were not the only ones uh, or the only sex breaking free of tradition working class women were also taking advantage of the growing entertainment culture and many saw no reason why they shouldn't take part in the growing commodification of sex if it meant having more freedom of movement and more money in their pocket Especially when one considers the harsh working conditions that faced working class women doing quote unquote respectable work. The largest industry open to women in the late 19th century was the sewing industry. Employment could be found in factories all the way down to the sweating system. Women engaged in prostitution could earn much, much, much more money and more quickly than working in the sewing industry or, say, as a domestic servant um, with much more freedom of movement. Girls believed to be virgins could earn up to $50 per sexual encounter. Weekly incomes for the average women engaging in prostitution could range between $20 and $30 in the city. Compared to the $12 to $15 a woman could earn working in a good factory job, most sewing um, jobs earned around $6 to $8. There's really just no comparison. Right. Um, And in addition to the potential monetary benefits, working as a prostitute could be fun. Women liked uh, women who liked to dance, to drink, to be loud and rowdy, certainly found the atmosphere at a brothel or a concert saloon just much more enjoyable than a dingy factory setting. Absolutely. It's also important to note that many women did not only work as prostitutes. Plenty of women worked other jobs, such as laundresses and domestic servants, and only engaged in prostitution when the need arose or an opportunity presented itself. This shows the fluidity of how commodified sex could be used for working class women as a means of income and diversion. Also, a phenomenon called treating began to become popular with many young women during the late 19th and early 20th century. Essentially, young women and girls offered sex in exchange for presents from men like food, drinks, entertainment, rent, or even clothing. They didn't view this as prostitution at all, but simply as a way to have fun and to get the things that they wanted or needed in return, right? They had a uh, uh, power, right? They had kind of a power and they could get things in return for right. it. Right. And think about this. I don't, I don't know, like... It will. It doesn't happen that much anymore. But when you go out on a date and like your mother says, now remember, if he takes you out for a nice lobster dinner, he's going to expect something, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. This idea that guys are expecting something in return. Yes, that comes from treating. Yeah, right. Um, but we should not overplay the choice that a lot of women had when working as prostitutes. Again, women's wages were drastically lower than men's wages. So if a woman found herself without a support system, particularly if she had children, prostitution might be one of the only options open to her. Working in, quote, the trade, which is what many prostitutes called their line of work, could be a never-ending cycle. Many women who found themselves in jail for prostitution found no other option but to return to the street or brothel when released. 
social purity reformers referred to prostitution as a slave cycle um, that the courts and the police were privy to. Essentially, police arrested a woman, the court charged her a fine, her madam or pimp came and paid the fine, and then the woman went right back out onto the street to make the money to repay them. Right. And this idea, I'm just going to kind of interject here that, um, well, on the one hand, you know, women could make a lot more money as prostitutes than they could, say, as a servant or as a, as a seamstress or whatever. But that uh, that situation could change if they had a pimp or a madam. Right. And then they would they might be making more, but they also had to pay a, a substantial amount of that back mm-hmm. to, you know, to whoever was kind of. Um, pimping them out, for lack of a better term. So they could could also be taken advantage of, right. is what I'm trying to say. Could be taken advantage of or could be providing them protection. So Right. It's all, yeah. There's it's all, so all super complicated. Of, yeah. Very super complicated. There's no one way that this happens. Right. Right. One former prostitute and brothel owner highlighted the hypocrisy of the social purity crusade as it pertained to curbing prostitution. Uh, She wrote, quote, the Christian world believes that it is easy for a woman to reform, that if she has the desire to do so, nothing more is necessary. All we've got to do is take good employment at good pay or marry a rich man. She went on to say that it was from economic want and the social stigma associated with female sexuality that kept women engaged in prostitution, not the lack of desire to reform. The sexual excesses of the mid-19th century met a more robust resistance from social purity reformers starting in about the 1870s. Numerous social purity organizations began organizing against prostitution and the visibility of commercialized sex. Anthony's Comstock, who most of us know as the name behind the Comstock laws that prevented persons from sending anything lewd throughout the mail, which includes birth control. So we talk a lot about that in kind of um, reproductive justice um uh discussions um but comstock he created the new york society for the suppression of vice in 1873 this was a group dedicated to stopping quote unquote vice so that means prostitution drinking gambling kind of all that kind of good stuff right um so to stopping this vice in new york city but Obviously, it did not eliminate prostitution. Uh, In fact, Comstock himself arrested three women in 1878, so five years after this suppression of vice society started. uh, He arrested these three women for performing a busy fleas dance in New York, in a New York City brothel. I just I just love the image of Anthony Comstock marching in and seeing these women performing these act on one another and and like okay but here's the deal yeah. he didn't just march in no he went in and acted as a patron so he got his full view before oh, yeah. he, he arrested them I I truly believe that Anthony Comstock it was like a tortured individual like he had he he was. He was interested in this stuff. Like, he had a fascination with this stuff. He was a sick... I I have always... That's my my personal Dude. belief about Anthony Comstock. There's there it actually is some evidence that during the Civil War he was struggling with masturbation, mm. and he wrote all the time in his diaries about being tempted by Satan to do those things that he shouldn't do, and like so he he had a weird sex things going on. Okay, but well we have not to, that masturbation we have to is have weird, but a, but during the time it was considered it was weird. right, right, yeah. and and even yeah. though everybody still did it, they felt really bad, after really they tortured did it. about it, right. 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 I still maintain that um, if I could go back in time and punch one person in the face, it would be Anthony (laughs) Costa. But you'd want to sit him down and ask him some certain questions. Oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Get the tape recorder out and listen to him confess. What what is is the the, the Veritas serum? Is it Veritas serum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Absolutely. So we'll stop off at Harry Potter first and then we'll go to 1873. (laughs) And then find out what a jar bean is. Okay. (laughs) So now we can't cut that piece. (laughs) All right. Okay. The social purity crusade also got a boost when William Stead, an English journalist, published in 1885 a series in the Pall Mall Gazette entitled The Maiden Tribute of Modern Babylon. This was a scathing expose of vice and the London underworld where Stead himself purchased a 13-year-old girl from her mother, supposedly for immoral purposes, to prove to his readers that London was the, quote, greatest market in human flesh in the whole world. 
Stead's stunt actually landed him in jail for three months. But the expose also ignited public interest in prostitution, both in England and in the United States. Some laws that were intended to curb prostitution actually made it expand. In 1896, the New York Reigns Law passed. Uh, this attempted to keep working-class saloons closed on Sunday. It only allowed hotels with 10 or more beds to serve alcohol on Sundays. Um, so what it essentially did is instead of shutting down sales of alcohol in saloons on Sundays, the saloons just converted their back rooms and upper floors into small bedrooms. Uh -huh. So saloons became hotels, and they took out hotel licenses. Um, so these these hotels, right, they, they became known as Rain's Law Hotels, um, and they turned high profits. Some operated as hotels, some as rooms for rent by the hour, which you know what's going on mm. at that point. People just needed a nap. And others straight up like brothels, right, where prostitutes lived inside of the hotel rooms. Such visible prostitution came to an end by the 1920s for a variety of reasons. A crackdown on venereal disease during World War I, prohibition and the increased policing of working class and entertainment districts, the telephone, which allowed women to be literally call girls and no longer um, which no longer forced them to work on the street or in a brothel, the changing norms of sexual encounters between middle class men and women. Uh, you know, in no way did commodified sex disappear. It just became less visible to the uninitiated public. Right. So it kind of came into what we, I don't know, would probably recognize today. You can still find it if you know what you're looking for. Right. But it maybe isn't quite as visible as it was. Although then you take into consideration like Times Square during the 70s. So obviously I think maybe stuff fits is, and spurts. Is, yeah, it's right? cyclical. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But certainly not um, like I. I, I like the word uninitiated there that like if you aren't kind of like already in that world, mm -hmm. you might not know where to go if you right. were looking for a sex worker. Unless you could pick up the gentleman's pocket guide, too. Yeah, right. that's what we need today. Right. Is, is the I'm gentleman's sure pocket they guide. exist. There probably it's is. The Internet. Yes, that's true. That's true. <laughs> well, and that's interesting. That's actually interesting because now maybe we don't have um, these pocket guides, but we have Craigslist. Oh, absolutely. Right. If you are looking for it, you can find mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. and then, yeah. I also find this really interesting because, um, you know, people, we talked about how this was a, a really um, a good opportunity for some women, right? This was an opportunity for some women to make much more money than they would ever make, you know, darning socks or mm -hmm. making shirt waists in a factory or something like that. Um, it gave women more control over their earning potential in a way that women still do, right? I mean, I was t just talking to someone recently about um, a friend of theirs who sold her used underwear on the internet mm -hmm. um, and made a bunch of money off of it. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, is that sex work? Sort of, yeah. right? You're but still... even straight up sex workers, I mean, yeah. they will tell you the same thing, you know, yeah. and they, ha they are forming... Not necessarily unions is in the respect that, but, you know, they are forming groups and organizations yes, right. for the same thing. You know what? Yeah. This is this is our work. This is our job. We choose to do this. We make a lot of money. And it's very professional. Right. Right. And that I, I listen to some po some sex podcasts and it's really interesting how sometimes they will they will just straight up tell people for for what it is that you're interested in. You should go find a professional like the way that you would say, you know. You have a loathsome skin disease. You should go find a dermatologist, right? right? You're if interested you have a, in a, a kink. Go yeah. find a professional that specializes in that kink, and, and then you know you're in good hands. Right. Like you're not, you're not taking that and finding just a rando mm -hmm. that could ruin your experience. Mm -hmm. Instead, you know, you want to have a threesome, hire a sex worker instead of finding some random person on Craigslist. I, I think that that's a viable option. Mm -hmm. Next time oh, I have a threesome, we are gonna yeah. get hate mail. <laughs> <laughs> No, I actually, I I don't know how, you know, you get into Twitter holes and you mm -hmm. start following, you know, and so I've, mm -hmm. I've seen so many awesome discussions about sex work and, mm -hmm. and sex workers um, going on on Twitter. And there's just so much to learn. It's such yeah. a, it's such a, um, an interesting topic. And um, yeah, I, I, I just find it fascinating. It's something that I had never, because you think about it as prostitution, right? You think of it as this re really negative 
thing, which in some cases it absolutely can be. Sure. Yeah, um, let's not gloss over that. Right. But at and the same time, it can be um, it can be a really it can be a force for good in people's lives. It like, can be empowering. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And for the for clients. Right. Clients who are right. really struggling sexually, trying to, to discover who they are sexually and aren't ready to date yet. But, you know, I, I find all of that very interesting. Well, and I think that's why at the beginning our discussion of nomenclature is important yeah. because that's why um, currently people normally use the word of sex worker mm-hmm. as opposed to prostitute because prostitute and prostitution has um, such negative right. connotations, you know, really from a lot of those quote unquote reformers right. that were there to uplift. Right. Mm-hmm. Um so fucking Anthony comes. That was that was a choice on our part, whether it's right or wrong. You know, we could have that debate or whatever. But um, I chose to use prostitute because that's what my sources are. Using. Yes. Yeah. And I, I think that it's important to continue to use that because that's the terminology of the day. Right. Right. Um, whether or not those people found it an empowering. Um, we can only conjecture. We, yeah, we can yeah. only speculate right. and we can't and we can't label them sex workers when they themselves label themselves absolutely prostitutes right amen sister all right so i'm elizabeth garner Mazurik. and i'm sarah hanley cousins thanks so much for listening we really appreciate it please follow us on all social media follow us on itunes stitcher yes. wherever you get your podcast apps review us yeah. on itunes we really 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 would appreciate it it helps us so much get the word out to to new listeners mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it will only take you two seconds and we will love you forever unless you're gonna leave a bad one yeah gonna if you're gonna leave off. a bad one then like you know you don't need to yeah and you can find show notes suggested readings um links to all of our past podcasts everything at links to our merch shop too. links to our merch shop everything go to dig podcast.org d-i-g-p-o-d-c-a-s-t dot o-r-g that was really smooth dang (laughs) all right thanks for listening see ya bye this podcast was produced by the historians of dig elizabeth garner Mazurik, sarah hanley cousins marissa rhodes and me averill earls you can find show notes and further reading at digpodcast.org. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest at dig underscore history and on Facebook at dig podcast. Thanks for listening. Women of every color can be found in the streets. Per- <laughs> I love how you say Italians. Why? What did I say? Italian. I don't know. I can't do the <laughs> buffalo thing. <laughs> Italian. Did you hear it? No. <laughs> Sorry. Did I say the same word? Oh, Why? How do you say it? Italians? I don't know. I, I'm sure if I tried to say it now, I'd say it all weird. Yeah, I know. Now I'm gonna At least you don't say Italian. <laughs> right. Some Italian dressing. All right. <laughs> the brothel had, quote, rosewood furniture. Should we... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Sorry. Are you dying? I don't think so. Some, some zucchini bread. <laughs>